Welcome back. Mineral-rich Congo exports a lot of metals that make their way into high-tech goods. The concern is that trade in these minerals, like so-called blood diamonds, is financing war in Congo. Now U.S. law requires companies to track the source of materials, but how realistic is it, and could it hurt the impoverished African nation more than it helps? Rick Goss is Vice President of the Information Technology Industry Council. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start with, uh, with the industry's reaction to this. This is, of course, part of the Frank Dodd bill, uh, and it requires that people understand where they're sourcing this stuff, some of which does end up in our, our high-tech gadgets. Uh, what, what's your, what can the industry do about it? Our industry was supportive of the due diligence approach here. In fact, it was close to a proposal that we had made in terms of enhanced public reporting. Uh, but we strongly believe that it needs to be part of a more coordinated international solution uh, led by governments, led by the international community to address the root causes of the conflict in the Congo. So, uh, Rick, help me with something. Let's say I was a politician in the Congo and I was now on the show talking to you and I point out that in the U.S. or Canada we mine potash or copper in the U.S. I'm just picking a couple of minerals. Uh, the government taxes it and then it goes to war in Afghanistan. What's the difference? Well, in terms of your analogy here, uh, you know, the focus that we have as the high-tech industry is trying to drive our transparency solutions through the supply chain. Uh, the, the issue here is one of the underlying lack of governance and security in the Congo. And our commitment as the high-tech industry is to do what we are able to do from this end of the supply chain to try to address uh, those concerns to do our part here. But as I noted, this is really uh, a job ultimately for the international community. You have an unparalleled diplomatic and humanitarian crisis here. Uh, the UN, the US State Department, regional governments need to come together to address these root causes. It does seem though uh, like a nice idea that's pretty difficult to put into practice in the sense that these are international uh, minerals, they find their way into international markets. We know even despite commitments around blood diamonds that it can be difficult to track where these things come mm -hmm. from, let alone a mineral that is processed into something else and then sold on the international market. So how realistic is this? Mm -hmm. That, that's an excellent point, Amanda, and, and there is a distinction, as you made, that makes this even more complicated than the diamonds issues because the diamond that is, is mined is physically the same diamond that ends up in the jewelry store. In the case of metals, uh, as you noted, they are mixed together, refined, processed, and their ultimate origin is forever lost at that point. It is a very long and complex supply chain, and as the high-tech community here, we, we've pioneered supply chain auditing protocols here that we're putting in place in smelters in Asia. We're working with our partners and in other industries and have invited them to join us in these efforts here to try to drive increased transparency on the ground in the Congo. Our ultimate goal here clearly is to source legitimately and responsibly. And we also want to work with the international community, work with other industries to make sure that our suppliers can remain economically engaged in the Congo because of the economic impacts of a withdrawal. So would you categorize what's happening here as um, unintended consequences of financial regulation? Because it sounds like you're adding a lot of cost to the whole process and in a way that you can never ultimately be successful. So if I'm a Michael Dell at, uh, you know, running a computer company, it just smells like cost to me because I can never know with certainty that the metals that are being put into my product didn't come from a country that perhaps is doing what you suggest they're doing. And it just, is, is this going to remain a cost as a result well, that, of financial regulation? That's an excellent question, Kevin, and, and you're correct here. There is no way to prove a negative. Uh, the challenges on the ground in the Congo in terms of the illegal taxation, the activities of the rebel groups, the extortion, et cetera, uh, make it impossible to say with absolute certainty that no shipment that wasn't supposed to get into the process ended up into the process here. What's important is to work on an, an assurance system to get that level of confidence, something that is accountable, uh, something that has verification behind it so you can achieve that level of confidence. We In terms of the cost issue, uh, the, the key point I'd make here is that the high-tech members that we represent are very focused and committed to this issue as they are to all sustainability issues. We don't see this so much as being a cost as it is a necessity of, of being good corporate citizens, of, t of taking this seriously and working as we've done for years on supply chain due diligence and supply chain accountability, frankly. And we have taken the lead even before these regulations went into effect. For years we've been working on this issue trying to drive increased accountability through our supply chain on this very issue. All right, Rick, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate being with us for this.
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Rick Goss, VP of Information Technology Industry Council. Time now for our priceless moment. Today it's all about hermits on the internet. In this case, a hermit dictatorship, North Korea is now on Twitter. The state-run news agency has set up an account on the microblogging site. Kim Jong-il doesn't shy away from the technology. In 2000, he famously asked then U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright for her email address. This latest move makes him the world's first twictator. His first tweet declared that the government-run media site Our World was on Twitter. And while some 2,000 people are following its tweets in a rare instance of Twitter imitating foreign relations, North Korea follows no one. After the break, the inbox. Stay with us. Watch CBC News Now for events as they unfold all day long. Starting with Heather Hiscox, a new face to CBC. Anne-Marie Medaway joins Suhanna Marchand and Carol McNeil. CBC News Now from 6 to 4.30 Eastern on CBC News Network. As a new host. Good morning, I'm Peter Armstrong. This is World Report. Peter Armstrong Washington brings journalistic excellence from the field to the studio. This is CBC News. World Report with Peter Armstrong on CBC Radio 1. CBC News Network. In the inbox, a question about ETFs. Peter asks, can you give your opinion on buying ETFs that are thinly traded and also an opinion on where Canadian banks are going with issuing ETFs? Uh, not all of them do. What's your take on thinly traded ETFs? This is an excellent question and you should, in my opinion, this is my opinion, never buy a thinly traded ETF. Wait till they mature, wait till they have stabilized markets and they have a tremendous amount of liquidity because that's the main advantage of owning an ETF in the yeah. first place. You never want a huge bid-ask spread or a large delta between the bid and the ask price of an ETF. And that's what you get sometimes when you have a thinly traded ETF. And you can tell by looking at the volume of trade. You know, the, pr the problem is if it's not large, in other words, look at the market cap first. How many dollars are in the ETF? Yeah. I like the billion dollar ETFs, not the hundred million dollar ones. And this is a great question. You need to go and do research. Go on the internet, it's all there. Make sure you're buying into something that has a tremendous amount of size and market capitalization and represents the sector and don't let it use leverage. Never buy these double ETFs. Again, my opinion. The volatility is crazy, and many of them don't actually track what the indices and are. And bank-owned ETFs, where do you stand on that quickly? Uh, I have not been a fan because none of them have actually successfully launched large ones yet. Hmm. That's the problem. All right.
We'll do it again tomorrow. Thank you. That's it for the show today. Remember, if you want to reach us, you can get us at exchange at cbc.ca or online in many other ways as well. As always, great to have you with us. That's the show for today. Stay with the network, though. Connect with Mark Kelly. Up next. The Lang & O'Leary Exchange is presented by Scotia Eye Trade. Scotia Eye Trade.